Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I thank you so much for joining us for our Classics Revisited webinar. People are just starting to come in. I just hit that start webinar button. So we're going to let people pop in. We are so happy to be continuing to host this great conversation and providing a work break uh, with more great titles of our world. This one coming from Ireland. Uh, we're going to give everyone just a few minutes to log in and get settled. While we do that, please set that chat panel to make sure you're sharing with everyone. Uh, this allows everybody to see everything that you're doing um, and let us know where you're coming from today. We always like to hear uh, where our attendees are, are popping in from. Today, we will wander through the capital of Ireland and journey to June 16th, 1904 in James Joyce's Ulysses. Published originally as a serial uh, release starting in 1918 and then into a novel form in 1922, Ulysses is a modern parallel to Homer's Odyssey. The book follows its three main characters through a day in their life as they contemplate guilt, compassion, and reinforcing one's identity. And let me tell you, this is a novel that is not for the... the <laughs> quick read. This is one that you want to take your time in, but Michael has set these great lectures up for short discussions on long books, and we are looking forward to it so much. We are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion, and we would love to hear all of the questions that Dr. Sugru's lecture may inspire. Today, I once again have the great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Michael Segrew to our ongoing webinar series, Classics Revisited. Dr. Segrew is a professor, um, is a graduate of the Great Books program. He earned his BA in history from the University of Chicago and his MA, Masters of Philosophy and PhD in history from Columbia University. Professor Segrew has taught at a prestigious university such as Princeton, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, and so many more. My name is Christy Goebel. I'm the Global Marketing Specialist here at Biblioteca. And behind the scenes on the chat panel, we have my colleague Mackenzie Crane helping to make sure everything runs smoothly. She'll also be sharing some links throughout the lecture and the Q&A that we have found that might help you with this book. We will be sharing the chat log uh, with all attendees, so make sure you switch your settings to everyone. Um, if you have specific questions, please do use the Q&A panel. The like button helps float the most popular questions to the top, so please use that feature if you see a similar question or something you want answered. You can fill in the Q you know, with questions as the lecture continues or definitely during our Q&A at the end. Once again, we are looking at today's webinar as a give and take discussion and would love to hear all of the questions that Dr. Segrew's lecture may inspire. With that, I know you're all here for that lecture and to get to those questions, um, I'm going to hand things over to Michael. We have recorded these reflections, this lecture in advance, but Dr. Segrew will join us at the end to take questions. Thank you and enjoy the lecture. Thomas Mann and James Joyce are the two giants of 20th century literature, at least in the West. And uh, the greatest achievement of Joyce is uh, regarded by, uh, is thought by many of his affectionados to be Ulysses. It's a retelling of the journey that the hero Odysseus makes. But in this case, it's an ironic journey for uh, a rather ironic hero, Leopold Bloom. And Leopold Bloom is a Dublin everyman. He's a Jewish salesman. He's married to Molly Bloom, who's habitually unfaithful. And he runs into Stephen Dedalus, who's, who's escaped Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man and shows up in the beginning of, uh, of Ulysses in the first four chapters, um, or rather first three chapters. And what it is is a recapitulation of Homer's Telemachy. If you remember that in the Odyssey, 
the first chunk is the first four books are about Telemachus' search for his father. And here we have Telemachus in the form of Stephen Dedalus, uh, eventually encountering, but staying away from, uh, Leopold Bloom. So Leopold Bloom is going to go through an entire day in Dublin, Ireland. And the day is a day in a way of uh, arbitrary significance, June 16th, 1904. And uh, it begins on one side of Dublin and it ends on the other. He starts out at home and ends up at home, but his homecoming is ironic. Bloom finally gets home, but his wife, Molly Bloom, who's the uh, analog of Penelope, in this case, instead of being faithful to him, is not. She's involved with Blazes Boylan, and he knows it. So it's an ironic homecoming, and it's an ironic heroism. And yet, there is a certain sort of glory in the way Joyce uh, deploys language. The way the novel begins, stately plump buck mulligan. Stately plump buck mulligan. Can you hear the music underlying that? Bum, 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 bum. It's like the beginning of a piece of music. And I think that there are certain dialects of English that lend themselves um, more than others to that certain kind of musical uh, element in language. I think the Irish version of English is one of them. And that's part of why they produce so many poets. Uh, but also, I think the Caribbean version of English uh, if you imagine some, a great poet like Derek Walcott, um, that too seems to me very musical and lilting. Uh, they have some, some similarities to, to the Irish version of English, but it lends itself to finding the music and the meter inside of language. And that's what Joyce is great at. If you remember back to uh, uh, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, how it ends, I go on to encounter reality for the millionth time and to forge within the smithy of my soul, the uncreated conscience of my race. It flows like water. And when we find Stephen Dedalus, I suppose pursuing the uncreated conscience of his race, uh, he is, is part of a larger uh, tapestry. And Joyce is giving us the very big view, the synoptic view of a Bloom, but also of a number of other characters. So Stephen Dedalus is Telemachus, Molly Bloom is the ironic Penelope, and uh, the complexity of this novel cannot be overstated, okay? Um, it is, astonishingly well-crafted. Every word, every image, every line is where it's supposed to be. Uh, Joyce was beyond fastidious when it came to uh, expressing himself in print. Now, um, in his retelling of Ulysses, uh, it's important to realize that similar to Dickens, it was produced in a serial form. So Dickens' novels go on and on and have many subplots. Um, that's something that, lent, that is derived in part from the serial uh, process. Every month you produce something else. Uh, Ulysses, as a self-conscious, uh, how can I put it, response, uh, or encounter with Homer um, connects the three parts of the Homeric epic with his novel. So the first is the Tel Telemachy. That's the first couple of books where Telemachus searches for his father. That's Stephen Dedalus. The next and body of the work, the most important and kind of heavily laden part is the Odyssey. And here we're gonna encounter the monsters and the 
allures and the attractions and the seductions that Odysseus did on his way back home. And Odysseus is going to have uh, a transformation. He's going to be uh, spiritually transformed as he is in the epic. Remember that eventually he loses all his men, all his booty from Troy, all his ships, even all his clothing. He washes up on shore, buck naked. All right, there's that comic scene when he's found. Um, the key thing here is that uh, Joyce is recapitulating those in each chapter. And the chapters are amazingly well structured, right? So we're going to meet uh, the Cyclops and we're going to meet the analog, once again, of uh, Scylla and Charybdis. And we're going to meet uh, the oxen of, of the sun. And we're going to uh, sack a city. And we're going to uh, blind a cyclops. So there's going to be a whole collection of correspondences. Um, but what makes Joyce different is that he's going to move from the gigantic macrocosm that Homer presents us with, and he's going to shrink it all down into one man and one day in a seemingly arbitrary, accidental way. But it's not. Uh, Joyce's Ulysses is trying to present all of human experience in a day. And uh, it is highly uh, complex in its structure. Okay, so for example, um, each of the places or each of the monsters that uh, that uh, Bloom, Leopold Bloom meets, um, like uh, oh, Aeolus or, you know, with the winds or uh, Cyclops and, uh, you know, the other various dangerous ones, Calypso, um, each of them corresponds to a different organ of the human body. So, for example, the sirens correspond to the ear, because that's what we hear the sirens with. And uh, Aeolus corresponds to the lungs, because he governs the winds. Uh, Scylla and Charybdis correspond to the brain, because they have to negotiate those Aristotelian extremes and get through the middle. And so, What's, what's being done there is uh, Joyce is constructing a man. This is the microcosm, macrocosm aspect of it. So each of these chapters is not only uh, based on an encounter in Homer, but it corresponds to uh, a contribution to the construction of the new man. And if you think about the redemption and transformation of Odysseus from his earlier bloodstained past, to the man he is when he tells the servant after the destruction of the suitors, don't, it's unholy to vaunt over the bodies of the dead. Um, Odysseus learns something and Leopold Bloom, uh, I don't know, has any such breakthrough. Um, it does end with a beautiful affirmation, but I don't know um, if it comes to, uh, <clears throat> to a conclusion uh, that uh, fully pulls apart Bloom. Uh, it's one of my favorite open-ended enigmas, uh, what Bloom is supposed to tell us about heroism and individuality. It's a very complicated problem. The reason why is that there's so many things keyed into him and keyed into the events that he, that he encounters. So not only are each of the events recounted in his journey, and remember the journey motif has been holding Western literature together ever since the beginning, everybody's going somewhere. And each of the sections refers to a body part, we're building a man, but it also refers to a specific color. So the entire color of the visible set of the visible spectrum, that gets covered too. Each of these sections is makes reference to or is connected to a specific color. Not only are they connected to colors, 
and to body parts, but each of them also calls upon specific parts of the arts and sciences, like poetry or history or science or physics or math. And each of those are, are keyed into the events of Bloom's uh, journey, his, uh, his odyssey through the streets of London, but it's also a spiritual odyssey. Um, Joyce writes like few others. Uh, he focuses intensely on subjectivity and interiority. And he tries to represent with words as far as you can go with uh, the deployment of language. So uh, he is always loading on meaning and reference and complexity to what started out as very complex books. Uh, his ambitions are enormous. And uh, this is in some ways the restatement from modern times with ordinary uh, democratic people. Um, what are trials and tribulations and what are spiritual journey amounts to. Uh, it can't help but force you to reflect on one's, oneself. Uh, the part that I guess always has stuck me most powerfully in uh, Ulysses is uh, chapter 14, the oxen of the sun. Now this comes very late, the oxen of the sun inc incident in the Odyssey. And this is where he's going to gain the wrath of Apollo by killing son of oxen that of course Ulysses, uh, Odysseus himself refrained from doing, but his men disobeyed him. <coughs> and the result was uh, divine displeasure. So here, what Joyce does is astonishing in its ambition and also in its cleverness. What he does is present a microcosm of the development of the entire English language. He begins with some Latin expressions and then moves on to a kind of a Germanicized uh, pronunciation and then into early English. And he starts with, I think it's uh, the Arthur uh, romance and with uh, the writers associated with Arthurian romance and takes it all the way up through, uh, oh, who would be some of, uh, to, through many figures, including, I think, uh, uh, let me think, Swift might be one of them. There's at least half a dozen, maybe as many as a dozen different important figures in Western literature that get parodied here. So what you can see is the evolution of language compressed down so you can watch it happen paragraph by paragraph. And the morphing of language is something that Joyce has a remarkable ear for. Um, he can find the sound and the music and the meter inside words, and he organizes them in ways that are quite uncanny. In that respect, he reminds me of, of Yeats, who had that same sort of strange magical power with words that I couldn't think of in a million years. So uh, imagine a quick run through of the English language as one of the subsets of Joyce's novel. Now, it ends with Molly's affirmation, affirmation of being married to Leopold Bloom and, or Poldy as she calls him, and uh, also um, affirmation of the world and of life. I would call it in the Nietzschean sense a life affirming work. Uh, regrettably, in 1934, uh, 10 or 12 years after it was first published, uh, there was an obscenity trial in the United States and it was regarded and treated as uh, subversive of public morals uh, because it talked about sex, masturbation, other things that we generally left out of uh, a discussion or put what we might call polite letters. And uh, this outraged the sensibilities of the censor, who was still very powerful, and uh, it made it 
all the way until a, a court had to decide that this was out, outside the realm of obscenity, that this was uh, a new, complicated, experimental literature, but it was not pornographic, despite the fact that it spoke with uh, an unusual uh, direction of uh, uh, frankness about things that didn't use, that didn't generally get get discussed that you won't find in the literature of say Tolstoy because it would be thought uh, contrary to art. Here, Joyce is trying to be much more realistic and practical, but at the same time, deeply symbolic, calling upon an entire array of uh, symbolic resources. Um, Stephen Dedalus is young Joyce and Elder Joyce may be uh, a combination of his greatest characters. Uh, Stephen Dedalus, of course, but also Buck Mulligan, also uh, uh, Leopold Bloom, and maybe also uh, Finn again, the spirit of F Finn McCool, as he is in Joyce's novel, uh, Finnegan's Wake. So this is well worth the effort and it's a big advantage if you have some time to put into it because it really is a commitment. But um, with any luck, this short discussion of a long book will get you to uh, want to take a look and want to read it. It's well worth your time. All right, thank you so much, Michael. If you can uh, go ahead and flip your camera on and join us, that would be great Hello. closer. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing very well, too. Thank you for joining us, I would say, on this very cold uh, December morning, but I, I feel like that's relevant to wherever you might be. It's snowing where that's I am, true. that's for sure. Um, but Joyce, wow. Uh, so this is, uh, you and I were chatting about this a little bit uh, as we came into the webinar today, and, and this is my second go through with it. First one was college probably didn't take as much in-depth learning in, at the time. And then this particular one, it is a massive novel with so many references, so many cross things. Like uh, some of the articles I was reading were saying it takes people a full year if they're going to really sit down and, you know, go through all of the annotations and references that are in it. God help me. I don't know whether it's a year or 10. Uh, <laughs> when I read it, we, it was a, I mean, we saw that it was a commitment. It was a bunch of friends of mine in graduate school. And I read it for a whole summer with a bunch of people that were a lot smarter than I am. And at the end of the summer, we had finished it and we had taken it apart and put it back together. And we concluded we hardly scratched the surface of the damn thing. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a real commitment in a way that uh, Portrait of the Artist or Dubliners is not. So yeah. if you want to get a taste of Joyce, this is not where to go. If, on the other hand, you want uh, a straight shot of Joyce at his best, yeah, you can't avoid this. Okay. So um, just so everybody knows out there is that I do have some prepared questions, but if you do have any questions for uh, Michael, feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. Uh, it is a pop-out, so if you can't find it, it might be hidden behind one of your screens. Uh, type them in there and I'll get to them. But you know, we were just talking about a portrait um, and I always say this wrong. I always want to say a portrait of a young artist, but it's a, a portrait of an artist as a young man, I believe. Right. So obviously that is in reference to a novel. Like there's an entire character here that is from that novel. Do you, can you go into a little bit more about what that novel was and why Joyce may have decided to pull that character into Ulysses? Okay, yeah. Um, Joyce is pushing the limits of the novel form. In some ways, um, trying to write a novel in English after Joyce is like trying to write a symphony after Beethoven's Ninth. I yeah. mean, even the best throw up their hands and say, I should find another hobby because I'm not gonna get beyond that. Well, to a certain extent, that's true in Joyce. On the one hand, his early novel, uh, Stephen Dedalus, um, is autobiographical. And it's a portrait, but not in space. It's a portrait in time and not using paint, but using words. 
So what he's doing is taking the idea of the portrait, shifting uh, art forms, and then as he shoehorns it into the, uh, the structure of the novel, in his next novel, he breaks out. And this is, you might want to think of this as the first hypertext. Okay. Right? So somebody has walked in from another novel and said, by the way, here I am. Uh, who could have done that before? Maybe Balzac. But um, this is a very strange thing to do, to step beyond the limits of, well, the story we got, which is the portrait of the artist as a young man. And now the artist is here again. I guess he's a little bit older, a little bit wiser. But uh, the fact that he shows up at all is, uh, well, a, a sign that this is these are connected into something more than a novel. Well, and it's it's interesting because you know, you know, literary series trilogies ongoing. Like one of my favorite, you know, it's for light reading, but one of my favorite authors. Uh, she, you know, all of her books stand alone, but she does bring characters and relations into each of them. So you kind of get like a taste of what that character that you loved from a different story is doing now. But if you didn't read that story, it's not a huge, um, huge hit. And that's kind of what uh, Stephen's character reminded me of is it was like, it, it's not, it's not, it doesn't seem connected <laughs> to his original book whatsoever. It's like, it could have been any character, but he chose to pull in one that he had already written. Well, uh, it could have been any character, provided he was content with portrait as being a self-enclosed finished artwork. But yeah. if what he wants to do is create a new kind of, say, molecule that connects these two literary atoms, I think that's what he's looking at. And then okay. there's a, a very strange group of connections that we'll get to uh, the final novel, which is Finnegan, in which case, not just the form of the novel, but the form of language breaks down. Got it. So the one thing um, I noticed on the second rereading, as well as the research I was doing to prepare for this, was there's a lot of Joyce um, in <laughs> all of his novels. And there's a lot of Joyce in Ulysses as well. And a lot of people don't even know that, you know, for as detailed as Dublin is in this book, um, and, and I have a later question about this, is that Joyce wasn't even in Dublin when he wrote it. Um, could you actually, one of the questions that we got from registration as well goes into this, but you know, that question was, was J James Joyce a Freemason? There was no context with that question, but could you go into a bit more okay. detail of James Joyce's history and life? Happy to. Um, James Joyce, uh, I know nothing of him being a Freemason, so okay. I, I cannot say yes or no. Um, in the absence of any reason to believe that he was, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't see the Masons, masonry stuff in Joyce the way I see it in, say, uh, Mozart, right? The magic flute, right? There's lots of masonry in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't see it in Joyce, but maybe he was. Um, there's so much going on. I always take the skeptical view that, you know, who knows what's going on there. Um, what was the other question? Uh, the other question was just to go into a little bit of James Joyce's history oh, um, his background. and his background, Very because much. like he, there's so much of him in all of his novels, uh, but especially in Ulysses and the Dublin references, obviously. But yeah, if you could uh, go into a little bit of sure. his history. Um, he's an Irish Catholic Jesuit product, which is, uh, it's like getting a, a Brahmin education. Uh, in the in, in the Christian world, they're a special group of very smart, very demanding teachers, and sometimes their demands were really cruel, as we see in the punishment of James Joyce uh, while he's at school in the uh, portrait. Um, he eventually loses his faith in God, loses belief in God, which means he loses the belief in uh, Catholicism and Christianity, but it also means that uh, the old verities family and country and nation, they all go by the wayside too. Remember how the novel ends, uh, uh, Joyce says, or rather Stephen Dedler says to himself, I go on to encounter reality for the millionth time and to forge within the smithy of my soul, the uncreated conscience of my race. So he is doing self-consciously what Homer was doing for the Greeks. And that's what uh, the place that this literary construction is supposed to fill in modernity. Okay. 
Interesting. Um, yeah, it, it, just so much about uh, Joyce is out there and even just his uh, quotes to this. Uh, before we move further, because I do have some a couple more Joyce questions, I did have a follow-up question to the um, other, uh, the, the portrait art of the artist. Uh, do you need to read the other novels first, such as um, Portrait of the Artist, in order to understand their appearance in Ulysses, uh, there being uh, the ca different characters? Like, would okay. reading his previous yeah. novels assist with that? You don't need to, but I mean, I, I want Joyce is one of the writers I taught for many years. And uh, unless you're a, a real, uh, a real glutton for punishment, start with portrait because portrait, while it's not an easy read by any means, is considerably more direct and more accessible than Ulysses. Then if you find that, you know, you have a taste of Joyce, try something like Dubliners then, his short stories, which are excellent, remarkably deft. Uh, someone once called, uh, he had a short story or actually kind of short novel perhaps uh, in the Russian sense, uh, called The Dead, which yeah. someone once called the best short story ever written because it's deeply moving and poignant. That's to be found in Dubliners. So I would, if you're going to be starting at Joyce, and this is particularly if you're not, if your first language is not English, because uh, native English speakers find Joyce very difficult. I, can't, I can hardly imagine what it'd be like to try and figure out what Joyce is doing with the English language if it were your second or third language. Uh, only a few great geniuses like, say, Conrad, have that depth of a grasp of other languages. So uh, it's a very difficult text. Do it with a teacher. That's the best way to do it. And if not with a teacher, then with a bunch of other people who are like minded, who are also willing to make the commitment. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, so with Joyce, like so when I was reading this novel, I have to say, and this was true. 20 some years ago too, when I first started reading it, um, the question why kept coming up. Why this, why that, why, um, why go into it? The very first one is one that I wanted to ask you just to get your take on it. And why 1904? Why that day? Especially since the turmoil that was going on in Ireland. So I'm more of a history buff than a literary buff. I do love yep. literary history, but the turmoil that was going on in Ireland during the years that this was written and even like from 1870s on, right. um, but during the years that it was written and published were so extreme. The Irish revolution was going on starting in 1919, the political turmoil in Ireland le leading up to that day um, and th those years, as well as World War I, for goodness sakes, was going on during this whole time, um, leading into the years the book was released. So why stick with 1904 specifically? Is there any significance to that? Okay, well, um, hmm. I can think of a number of ways to take that. Uh, when I was in college, uh, people used to joke uh, with math majors and ask them what the most random number was. Okay, yeah. well, it could be that uh, June 16th, 1904 is the most random day. In other words, he's looking for something that is not conspicuous, that doesn't have anything important happen in it, because what he's looking for is the extraordinary within the prosaic. Okay. So um, he says, really, uh, there was no great headline the next day because not all that much happened in Dublin. Business was conducted, lies were told, uh, people uh, died and people were born, but it was no day to remember, like uh, 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 some, for some extraordinary happening. So what he's looking for then is every man and every day packed into this particular day and to this very improbable uh, hero, Leopold Bloom. Um, you may have noticed, but in turn of the century Dublin, um, my understanding is that there weren't all that many uh, Jewish uh, advertising salesmen in Dublin at the time. Okay. It would have been 99% Catholic and they would have had all kinds of things to do, but the, you know, the random wheel, the kind of bingo <laughs> or the, uh, the lotto uh, choice that uh, uh, Joyce made allows him to uh, um, play with words in ways that are both revealing and, uh, I mean, brilliant. 
For example, um, Molly Bloom always refers to her husband, Leopold, as Poldy. And what, Le and what Poldy is, is Leopold with the Leo left out. Okay. Right? All right. She is habitually unfaithful to him. Right? So she's an ironic Penelope. Yep. All right. So the fact that he gets Poldy rather than Leopold indicates their relationship. Now, I would never have thought to subtract Leo from Pold, but it's the kind of thing that pops into Joyce's head because he's often fragmenting words into their constituent parts, uh, which is beyond the level of meaning. It's really strange. Uh, he loves the sound of words, and there's a certain sort of music built into this. So uh, one of the things I've heard is a, a recording of... Uh, uh, Ulysses, and it takes you know it takes many hours, but it's wonderful to listen to. It's like water running downhill. Yeah, it's so well, it's, and it's that lyric. You know, you mentioned it in your lecture too. It's that lyrical sound and lilts of uh, the Irish accent. If you're if you're not as familiar with uh, that particular accent, it's just the you know I always I always think of it as more of like the higher lilt of that particular region versus a, a lower gruffer um head you know you you bring up bloom uh and and i have to say like some of the articles i read i saw you know like they, they classified him as all sorts of things as an ironic hero as an anti-hero all sorts of different fact you know classifications as to how to how to how to name this protagonist but for the character that a day bloomsday has been recognized globally not necessarily as a federal hot but you know people make it a thing on, on Bloomsday. Yeah. Um, and the character name people know from the novel, like if you're going to pull out any name from the novel, most people will recognize Leopold Bloom. Mm -hmm. There seemed to really be not a lot of movement or realization within this character throughout the course of the book. Um, you even mentioned in your lecture that there is really not a great conclusion for Bloom. Could you go more into this character development or does it go back to kind of what you were saying about the date where it's just to show an everyday feel of an every man? It's a little bit like the ending of War and Peace. I'm not talking about the epilogues. Yeah. But if you've made, if you paid your dues and gotten, you know, all thousand pages through War and Peace, you'll find out that it ends but doesn't really have a conclusion because it's meant to represent the universe and the universe keeps on flowing on. Okay. So at some point, uh, Tolstoy has to says, look, my story is already too complicated. I'm going to cut this off. Joyce's Ulysses is in some ways like that. In other words, uh, life continues on. There's no reason why we shouldn't have another chapter, except that, well, um, there's a point at which you have to walk away from uh, a piece. And this also mirrors the fact that the Odyssey itself, if you remember that, also has a kind of anticlimactic ending. Mm -hmm. One of the great problems in epic is that epics don't end the way they should. The Iliad ends with uh, Achilles being uh, uh, compassionate to Priam, not with the fall of Troy. And the Odyssey ends not with the killing of the suitors, but with Odysseus saying, oh, now I got to go do a whole bunch of diplomatic things and go see my dad and a whole bunch of other stuff because he's got all these loose ends to tie up. Um, it's a very inelegant ending. Um, even if you look at uh, Virgil's Aeneid, um, he also has a problem of an ending, but he's not stupid. He talks about how great Augustus is and how Rome is destined to rule the universe, and he's hoping to get a villa in Tuscany if that's possible. So he knows what strings to pull, but even that's a very inelegant literary move. Now here, Joyce is coming to the end of his Odyssey, and what it is is um, a, a sort of reconnection, but a comic reconnection with Molly. Yeah. Right. Molly is um, uh, involved with Blaze's Boylan now. Uh, Bloom has had the lion taken out of him. And uh, the character is certainly one of the most memorable, but in a way, like without the sinister implications, like Kafka, he's memorable for being an ordinary guy. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up the, the epic factor. So this is our, 
you know, fourth large book, you know, we had Moby Dick, we had Magic Mountain, we had Brothers Karamazov right before this. And in all honesty, they all kind of were the same. It, like, I would say the Magic Mountain had an ending um, or yeah. alluded to the ending, and that would be yes. really kind of the only epic that really wrapped itself up to a certain extent. Um, yeah. But now that now that you mentioned that, like, it is an interesting thought process with epics is like, where do you go from the epics? Because clearly, if the hero survives, it's it's they just go on with their life like after this I mean, massive adventure after this massive thing it just continues it's not an accident that we have what a dozen star wars movies yeah here's why it's yeah. a video epic and it refuses to die because there's always prequels and sequels and stuff going on somewhere else and uh you can get an infinite number of stories out of this uh provided you have enough special effects yeah well and it just it just goes um when we you know wrapping back into to ulysses is the amount of layers that joyce put through this book is just yeah. um insane so i wanted to move on um the iliad and the odyssey obviously most people if they haven't read them um are very much aware of them they, they you know they're classics they're one of the the first greek classics that most people can reference um just even in plot lines they've been done multiple ways most people at some point in school had to read at least one if not both of them right yeah, you're, you're um even sins. yeah even as early as junior high high school you had to read at least one if not both um why the mirror to Homer's work? So an article from the New Yorker that uh, Kenzie's going to share in the chat here stated that Joyce once was quoted to say that Homer's character Ulysses, and I'm paraphrasing here, that Homer's character Ulysses is the best all around character, a complete character. He compared Ulysses to Hamlet, something that he kind of references in um, his novel as well, saying that Hamlet was a great character, but just a son. Like everything that inspired Hamlet was because he was the son of the king who got murdered. Ulysses was a father, a son, a commander, a warrior, a friend, a husband, and so much more. With this much admiration of a historic literary character and even the historic uh, literary work of Homer, why would Joyce try to even attempt to mirror Homer's works um, to this extent? Okay. A couple of reasons immediately pop up. Okay. Um, Joyce is very influenced by Nietzsche and okay. Nietzsche's appreciation of Homer. Uh, remember, Nietzsche thinks that uh, we went wrong with that Socrates guy and then Plato was even worse. Yeah. So he would like us to go back to those Homeric heroic values. Now, uh, Portrait of the Artist is certainly a Nietzschean novel. And in many respects, the outline here is uh, Nietzschean in its indeterminacy, but also um, it uh, doesn't provide us with uh, a central backbone. There's a whole bunch of episodes, but the only backbone we have is the tradition that comes out of Homer, all right? Okay. It wouldn't hold together otherwise. So what he's trying to do is revive the Homeric tradition. It's a way of saying, yeah, Nietzsche, you got that right. Um, but it really takes a poet with some great chops to rewrite Homer or to try and do better than Homer. If you remember our treatment of Dante, where he announced that he was one of the seven greatest poets that ever lived, and he was willing to admit Homer into that august group. But uh, uh, I'd be inclined to think that uh, uh, Joyce is more, uh, more flexible and perhaps uh, uh, not quite so megalomaniacal. I, uh, hmm. I mean, well, let me finish. Let me leave, leave that there. Okay. Right. Pick up the thought. Um, no, it's 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 great. Like I I loved the references. I love the parallels. Um, you and I were chatting right before the webinar about it not necessarily being in um, in order. You know, in 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 order of the book, but it definitely parallels the book, you know, yeah. throughout the, throughout the case. And it was just one of those things. It's a, it's a, it's a huge, you know, Homer is, is a, <clears throat> such a classic writer, right? Everybody recognizes it, that it's such an undertaking to try to mirror it. Now there have been contemporary writings of the Odyssey, but it's normally taking the Odyssey directly, you know, oh brother, where art, uh, is it no brother, where art thou? 
um the movie from you know with george clooney back right, in the right. early 2000s like that was a modern telling of it but they go through very clearly whereas this was a complete different take on it but it has those parallels throughout the whole thing well if you get a chance it's worth looking at derek walcott's omeros okay which is the kind of caribbean version of homer and of course it gets its own transformations there too but it's a beautiful piece of work and uh I guess what, what joins all of the different attempts to tell and retell uh, the Odyssey, I think there's a Steely Dan song about the Odyssey, about Homer as well. Yeah. And uh, what holds them all together is the sea and it's sloshing around. I mean, think of Aeneas, right? Uh, running the Mediterranean so he can get to Italy. And uh, of course, Odysseus himself. Um, when we get to Joyce, um, we don't have the right size heroes for a, a genuinely tragic result here, I don't think. No. Instead, what we get is a mock epic, uh, and it, it straddles the line between mock epic and epic. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Uh, there's a comic element here. Uh, remember, Penelope is great for her ingenious putting off of the suitors. Molly is remarkable for her ingenious not putting off of the suitors. Uh, Joyce himself is going on a journey, but this journey is as much interior as it is exterior. And of course, the places he goes, it's Dublin at the, uh, of 1904, which would be, exist very clearly in Joyce's memory, is not a big place. Um, it's not quite everybody knows everybody else, but most people know, if they don't know some, if somebody else, they know somebody that knows them. It's just not that big. It's a very close-knit community. So, uh, it's hard to keep secrets there. Yeah. And uh, Joyce is uh, straddling the line between uh, revealing these secrets and saying, look, uh, it's better that most of these get left alone. Uh, if you think of the irony of Molly saying, yes, yes, she's talking about accepting Leopold's marriage proposal, right? But she's been adulterous with Blazes Boylan that day. Yeah. So you know, she's the anti-Penelope. Well, and, and you know, you, you mentioned like, I like the, the epic monk ep epic because really none of these characters in Ulysses go through anything so extreme that most people would relate to an epic story. It's, it's a day in the life in 1904 in Dublin. A lot of it's just inner contemplation, walking around with some, you know, weaving to avoid certain things and, and talking to others. And so it's, it's, it's an interesting look because it is such a long novel and a very detailed story with so many different layers. But really, like when you think of an epic, you think of a massive adventure, you think of a, you know, ongoing big event. And, and really, that's not here, but yet it is still epic like. He's trying to celebrate the prosaic and say that life itself is an ongoing big event. You don't yeah. have to destroy a city for that to be the case. Uh, on the other hand, it's also important to note that the literary culture in Dublin is not like the cult literary culture I've ever experienced anyplace. I've done a fair amount of traveling. And yeah. Um, yeah. when I got picked up in Dublin airport to go to my hotel, um, my cab driver talked to me about Joyce and why he thought he was a very poor writer. And I'm thinking, well, that's unusual. I thought that, you know, I got that one in a million cab driver who had an interest in modernist literature. But no, um, everybody has an opinion about Joyce. And it doesn't matter whether it's your waiter or a professor of, of <laughs> literature. Everybody has read this stuff. Um, the Irish like literature so much that there's no tax on literary writers or their yeah. income. So they allow writers to live tax free so long as they write there because they really like literature. Um, it's not an accident that so much of uh, literature in the English language comes from Irishmen like uh, Wilde or uh, Yeats in particular. Yeah. So yeah, uh, Joyce is just a is one in a line of um, extremely powerful Irish writers. Um, it's it's true on uh, on opinions as well with like Beckett. Beckett's one of their more famous playwrights along yeah. with Wild, and I remember having continuous conversations about every opinion 
uh, known to man regarding Beckett. And I have my own strong opinions. <laughs> um, I do have to say that one of our um, audience members did uh, note that the song is Home at Last by Steely Dan. They, they there it is. Yeah. There Thank you go. You. Well done. There you There's go. civilization for you. <laughs> Um, one of the things I have, I have two more main questions. One of them we've kind of touched on, but just the detail in this book about Dublin is incredible. Like, you know, uh, Joyce, you know, Joyce quoted, was quoted at one point saying something along the lines of like, if you needed to, you could rebuild Dublin based on Ulysses because there is that much detail. Um, and once again, he wasn't living in Dublin at the time that he wrote this. So this was all from memory and all from his life growing up and his everything. Um, could you just t briefly touch on like, you know, if there's any meanings behind the depth of his uh, descriptions or location selections, selections, and why Joyce was so adamant regarding the in-depth descriptions of Dublin the way they are? The architecture of Dublin, uh, not in the sense of individual buildings, but in the sense of city planning, um, corresponds to the architecture of the book. Hmm. And uh, the places we go are so typically Irish. Um, for example, we go to a number of different locations, but the only uh, kind of location we visit twice are pubs. <laughs> okay. Right? And there's a Fair. reason for that. That's true. Right? That's, yeah. There's one, yeah, one early, one late, and we're not finished with the day yet. Okay. <laughs> well, no, I mean, uh, the pub is the uh, nexus of Irish social life. Yes. Yeah, so I, mean, go, I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor or where you go. Um, everybody, you know, at lunchtime or after after work stops off for a pint. It's just the way in which people socialize. Mm -hmm. So it's the, you know, it's the, and look, they have really good beer. They make Guinness. So uh, you could see why they would. But uh, in addition to the pubs, we go to a pharmacy. Now the idea of healing and medicine all the symbolism surrounding that is going to be important early on. Uh, we go, to, then we stop at a pub, but then <laughs> we go to the National Library. Yeah. Now, it's very convenient that the National Library of Ireland, which, among other things, I believe, has the Book of Kells, um, should be so close to uh, a convenient pub. You leave the pub, you go to the, to the National Library, you chat with the librarians, and you meet a friend. That's how closely intertwined the social life is here. It also indicates why Joyce as, a, as an individual had to leave. It's absolutely suffocating. Everybody knows you and your family and your parents and what people would think. And you, you really can't live as an individual without having people impose themselves on you. So he's doing, he, he's going back, but he's looking at, at uh, Dublin like a ghost would, all right? From the library, we go to the river. The river is connected with the idea of time and the flow of time. Uh, then back to the pub, a different pub this time, right? Uh, he, uh, Bloom gets insulted. Uh, you know, there's an anti-Semitic undertone. Uh, from there to the maternity hospital. Why? Well, I mean, we need new life because I'm sure people were dying. Uh, actually, we passed a, uh, a funeral earlier on. So yeah. we have to cram every possible human experience in here. Birth, <laughs> death, uh, the difficulties and anxieties of life. And then finally, from, from the hospital, we go to the brothel. Why? Well, this is where tomorrow, which is where nine months from now, those babies are coming from, <laughs> right? So we have sex, we have death, we have birth. Uh, I don't know that we've left, uh, we have sickness, we have health. I don't know that we've left all that much out. So um, stop and think not just of the locations, which again, you can get a pretty good idea of, uh, from Joyce's descriptions, but step back and ask yourself why he goes to these places in this order and what these stops are supposed to symbolize apart from the relationship to Joyce. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, that the, the locations are also just related to the human experience. I hadn't actually made that connection. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. It opens my mind to a whole bunch of different things that I may have missed in the novel for sure. I always feel that way when I'm reading Joyce. Everybody I talk to says something different. I say, well, yeah, I guess that's possible, isn't it? It's possible. There's, well, he's a layered author, like, and yeah, going really into is. his writing style. So we only have a few more minutes. And, and I know that this is probably going to take longer than that few more minutes. But oh, okay. my goodness, 
the chapter and writing style of the book itself. Uh, the chapters, uh, which I believe he calls episodes, but just when you are in a rhythm, you and I chatted about this a little bit ahead of time, you know, the narrator, the style, or the genre changes um, styles from chapter to chapter. A chapter is a play. Mm -hmm. um, as you stated in your lecture, there is an entire chapter that basically walks through the linguistic history of the English language as it goes through. Could you yeah. go into just a little bit of detail regarding these choices, okay. how it yeah. might help people to read it and understand why those styles, genres are made, you know, are, are changing throughout? Yeah, okay. Um, complicated question. Let me take a couple of stabs at it. First off, um, Joyce is trying to find the limits of language. Now, the limits of language can be found at the level of the sentence or even at the level of the word, but they can also be found at the level of the literary genre, all right? Each of these things, uh, grammar, syntax, uh, and li uh, literary constructions, all have their own inner logic. Now, what Joyce is doing is testing the, the, uh, the, the structure of these linguistic entities and seeing how he can connect them and how he can fool around with them and how he can articulate something, not necessarily by the phrases alone, but also by the implications uh, of these words for the kind of mind that would generate. Let me see if I can show you what I mean. If you think back to Descartes, Descartes thought he had a real easy direct access to it, his inside feelings. He would just look in, in uh, introspect and he would know that. Mm -hmm. um, Bloom and the other characters here don't have that easy direct introspection. They're often unstable characters with an unstable grasp of reality, both inside and outside. So we have to learn to correct for the mistakes they habitually make. And what that means is that we're seeing some of the curvature of their psyches, which is a very interesting thing to do. Yeah. Uh, abandoning the, uh, the uh, omniscient author of, uh, the omniscient narrator of Tolstoy in favor of all too human narration um, in some ways, reflects the change in the conception of the human mind that we had in Descartes' time in 1630 and that we have in Joyce's time, 1910. Uh, the difference is uh, that there's been a fragmentation of subjectivity and of the self, and that fragmentation was performed by Sigmund Freud. He said, you have a conscious part, but you also have an unconscious part. And what that is, is actually the philosophy of mind analog Okay. of breaking the atom into its constituent parts. You see, um, for, for Descartes, the cogito, the ego, the individual is completely integral, it's an atom. But when Freud smashes that atom, you get all kinds of interesting epistemological problems. And the same thing happened in physics. Now with Joyce, the same thing is happening in literature. He's fragmented the subject, you only have bits and pieces who are only in intermittent contact with each other. So you get these flawed, strange perspectives. Now, let me bring that back to what I was what you asked about with the style. The most obvious and for me, most difficult part of the style is that uh, stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. There, grammar is gone. Punctuation is gone. Uh, the difference between description and utterance is gone. Uh, what we get is a kind of, how can I put it, a, a chemical slurry of consciousness <laughs> that hasn't been broken up into the ordinary uh, building blocks of our thinking, which is called grammar, all right? Yeah. Uh, so we still have nouns and verbs and adjectives, but now they relate in a not in an indeterminate way, because we have a whole paragraph of these things without the, the uh, markers, which are called punctuation, that tell us how these things are supposed to be in a logical relation, all right? One of the funny things about Joyce is that just about the time that he's breaking down the logical relationship between sentences, uh, analytic philosophy is elevating individual sentences and absolutizing the precision with which they break them down. So you got people in the culture pulling on both ends of the rope 
And that's uh, in some ways the tension between art and science in the era just before the First World War. It's just, um, to me, it's just amazing how one man can not only put that different, you know, those differences together, those layers together, take that many different writing styles and still make a cohesive book. It does make it a little bit more difficult to read for sure, but it does make it worth it. So thank you so much, Michael. I really a appreciate your conversations. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Um, bye. -bye. bye. Uh, Ulysses was unfortunately at the moment our final episode um, of the Classics Revisited webinar series with Dr. Sagru. Um, he's wrapping up the year with us here. We are so glad uh, you have all been able to enjoy it and hope you have a fabulous holiday season and a happy new year. Kenzie just shared in uh, the chat, we encourage you to look at our Classics Revisited webinar series playlist that has all 18 lectures um, with the full webinars uh, that Michael has done with us. That uh, link is there and you'll also be able to find it on our webpage. If you have enjoyed today's webinar, Biblioteca is continually adding to our virtual event lineup. Uh, we do have an ED another EDC um, webinar coming up next week. We encourage everybody to go to um, our biblioteca.com and navigate to our insights and trends blog to keep up to date with what webinars may be coming up. And make sure you do subscribe to receive our webinar updates by navigating to the bottom of any page on our website and hitting subscribe. Um, as we do finish today, we are sending out that survey one last time. I know a number of you have been repeat uh, viewers of ours. We love all of your comments. We do share them with Michael. Um, and it also lets us know what your thoughts are if we do find a way to continue the series um, or similar series at Biblioteca. Um, we love to hear from all of you and do utilize your feedback um, to continually evolve the webinar series we offer to libraries around the world. Just a reminder, we will circulate um, the references uh, and links uh, to resources in our follow-up email, as well as on our website. Uh, so keep an eye out for those in your inbox. Thank you again. We appreciate all of you. We hope you have a great new year um, and a happy holiday season. Have a great day.